board the shuttle challenger today you may want to return for your local programming however nbc news will continue its continuous coverage of this national tragedy here today and what we want to do now is show you once again what happened today in the skies over florida just out over the atlantic ocean at about one minute and 15 seconds after a liftoff of the space shuttle challenger with seven people on board and liftoff, liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Roger, roll, Challenger. Good roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. Engines beginning throttling down now at 94 percent. Normal throttles uh, for most of the flight, 104 percent. We'll throttle down to 65 uh, percent shortly. Engines at 65 percent, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. Velocity 2,257 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles, downrange distance three nautical miles. Throttling up, three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go with throttle up. Challenger, go with throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, nine nautical miles. Downrange distance, seven nautical miles. Those are the parents, Ed and Grace Korg, and the parents of Krista McCall. It appears at this point they don't know what has happened, but others, of course, realize that something seriously has gone wrong. in slow motion now. To my eye, at least, it appears that the entire external tank just came apart and became one gigantic fireball. It would have been, at that point, a bomb. To the right, you see the solid rocket booster peeling off. It appears that it was that big fuel tank that we see attached to it, the largest part of the, of the shuttle program, that uh, just seemed to come apart. And, of course, it is chock-a-block with uh, volatile oxygen and hydrogen to fuel the main engines. The parents, Ed and Grace Corrigan, as they were watching that, didn't quite know what to believe as we looked at them. And, of course, this was their first launch. And as they looked at it, it appeared that there may have been a second booster going off one kind or another. But, unfortunately, that was not the case at all. In Concord, New Hampshire, where Krista McAuliffe was a school teacher, the entire community was involved, as you might expect. Her third grade class was at Cape Canaveral today with a large banner watching that tragic scene. The banner said, Go, Krista, Go. And at a high school auditorium, there were about 1,500 students assembled so that they could watch on television. Here are the kids. The successful liftoff, lots of celebration. But then something is wrong. sent back to their classes, stunned as we all were by what had happened, but a much closer personal attachment to at least one member of that shuttle crew, Krista McAuliffe, a school teacher in the community of Concord. The ebullience of high school students drained from them as they watched on television screens as the shuttle blew up today. Sharon, Krista McAuliffe, and six other astronauts apparently have died in that gigantic fireball explosion. The crews continue to search the ocean with uh, a variety of vessels and airborne vehicles, uh, helicopters, and Coast Guard cutters are out there. They were kept from the area for some time because of the debris. Jay Barbary is a veteran 
a reporter on these uh, space programs. He's been down in uh, Cocoa Beach, Florida since the very beginning of the space program. He was there today and he watched all of this as well. Jay? Well, it was something that you didn't want to see, Tom. We were watching it as it took place into a blue sky, and we were watching it as it happened. Of course, when we saw it, we knew what had happened, but we just didn't want to believe it. And now the recovery forces are hard at work 18 miles east of here, trying to find what is remaining, the remains, rather, of uh, Challenger and the crew. Jay, no word whatsoever, I gather, from the NASA officials who are still assembled there. They're giving you no indication, and we expect, what, a press briefing in about 20 minutes or so? That's correct. We will have the top officials here, and at that time, we should know what has been taking place uh, since the Challenger went down. But as now, there's only speculation and only looking at the videotapes, and we know the recovery crews are out there. What they've found, we do not know, but we should know shortly. What happened to uh, Krista's uh, husband and children and her parents? Do you know where were they taken? Well, they were, of course, escorted by NASA personnel, and I'm sure that they were taken back to the astronaut quarters, which is only a couple of miles from here, and I'm sure they're in seclusion there. And as you looked at that videotape, as we looked at it together, what was your judgment, Jay? You've watched a lot of these go up, of course, and uh, you've not seen anything quite like this before. But did it appear to you, as it did to me, that it could have been the external tank that went first? I don't think there's any question about it, Tom. I think you're absolutely correct. It was the external tank. Now, the question is, when they told him he was go for throttle up, he increased the uh, throttle pressure, increased the thrust on the three prime engines. The question is, was there a flareback of the engines at that time? If there was a flareback, they could have, this could have erupted the external fuel tank. There could have been any kind of eruption of the ducts leading the hydrogen and the oxygen into the engines. But it occurred at the base of that tank without question. Why it occurred, of course, is the question. Is it conceivable, and again we point out that this is only speculation on our part, but is it conceivable that, there might, that it might have been weather related, that there was ice forming, of course, at the base of the, uh, of the main engine at, earlier in the day? Is it possible that ice may have played a role in all of this? It's very possible. A chunk of ice off of the external fuel tank itself could have ruptured the ducts leading the fuel from the tank itself into the main engines. Another possibility are the wind currents at maximum Q. At that time, in the position that the uh, spacecraft was in, the wind, the current there, could have had something to do with the flareback of the engines. No one really knows. There's a lot of uh, things that you can speculate about, but what we do know Tom, without any question, that explosion occurred in the external fuel tank where 500,000 gallons of fuel was located. That thing is 15 stories tall. So if you can imagine a 15-story tall building, something holding a half a million gallons of fuel, then you can imagine what sort of explosion that happened. All right, we want to show once again on the model that we have here in our Washington studios just what we're talking about. This is the space shuttle itself. This is the vehicle, this is the Challenger, and it is attached to all this propellant. These are the solid rocket boosters on either side. They develop a million pounds of thrust apiece, and as Jay indicated to you, in this large external tank, which originally was painted white, and then they removed the paint because they determined they didn't need it and they wanted to save the, the weight, this 15 stories high altogether, filled with oxygen, and hydrogen and it fuels the main engines which are located at the very base down here of the shuttle challenger or and the other shuttles for that matter as well they're used on liftoff and then they're used as well to get them into orbit then they're fired up once again when they come back into uh, the earth's atmosphere you remember that phrase miko that's main engine cutoff they fire them up to about 65 percent and lift off then they go to 104 percent or even higher if they need to to go into uh, uh, the, the orbit itself, and it was just at that point when they went past 65%, past 100%, full throttle, shortly after that, that this appeared to just break into flames, and then of course we saw that large fireball. So the indications are, at the outset at least, that it happened somewhere in here, possibly in these ducts, and as Jay Barbary indicated, there are ducts that lead from the external tank here back into the main engines. That's where it may have occurred. There's always the possibility that a number of other things could have happened as well that then triggered all of this fuel that is contained there. At any rate, it's like a giant rocket going off, a Roman candle, if you will, with two on each side and a much larger one in the middle. And people positioned right up here, seven of them all together today, 
with no means of getting out of there once they have launched. That is, that there is no escape hatch of any kind, no ejection seat. And based on what we saw today, there was very little to eject from, tragically enough. To remind you, in about 20 minutes, we expect to have a press briefing from the officials at NASA at the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral, Florida. We may know more then. Of course, they have a wide variety of data, telemetry of all kinds, signals coming in electronically and otherwise. Uh, they'll be looking at that and analyzing it if, in fact, they can. The entire country, shocked by what we have witnessed here today. Uh, I'm sure that we're bond together in our common uh, sympathy for the families of all the people who are involved. And there are grave political and I economic questions right, raised right. as well. John Dancy is on Capitol Hill now, and he has the reaction of some of the principal players there. John? Tom, probably no program has enjoyed the kind of support that the space program has enjoyed throughout, uh, throughout the, its history here. Through periods of budget austerity and uh, financial crisis, the space program has continued to enjoy support from many members here. There is no indication that despite this tragedy today, it is going to have any less support. A number of members of Congress, both on the House and the Senate side, have been in the respective press galleries giving their reaction to what happened today. Let's start off with some of it. This was Congressman Manuel Lujan, who is chairman of the House Science and Technology Committee. He was with Dr. Graham, the NASA administrator, when it happened. We learned that it had, there had been an explosion in, in the vehicle, and he said, oh my God, you know, what a terrible thing to happen, and was very visibly uh, shaken and uh, ran out of the office and went uh, went to his office. Well, it's very difficult for me to talk about it because these were my friends. Mike Smith, the uh, pilot, was my mother hen the first month that I trained. They assigned him to me, go to my classes and help uh, brief me. And I don't know of any time that I have been more shocked or more moved than when my first wife was killed in an automobile accident. And so it's been uh, very, very difficult for me this morning. I don't think uh, that it's time to start examining whether or not we continue with programs, uh, but uh, certainly at least we ought to uh, take a deep breath and uh, step back uh, before we go ahead with uh, any further uh, manned flights. Let me be philosophical for a moment. I guess in our human existence there is triumph and there is tragedy. And uh, man tries many things. And uh, we advance as a whole human race because we, because we succeed most of the time. We make advances, whether it's in space or engineering or health or medical things. Sometimes, though, we aren't perfect. And then there's a tragedy that uh, brings us back to our own human frailties and our, our lack of perfection. And so that's the kind of a day we're faced with now. It's been an amazingly succe successful series of triumphs through the years. But it also is fraught with the possibility of tragedy, and that's what we came up against today. Tom, Senator Glenn and Senator Garn, the two senators who have flown in space, will be going with the vice president in about uh, 15 minutes from now, headed for Cape Canaveral to be there and to console the families uh, who today were struck by this tragedy. Tom? John, I think that we'll also hear later this afternoon from Congressman Bill Nelson. It is in his district that uh, the Kennedy Space Center is located, and he flew on the most recent of the space uh, shuttle flights as well. We've not yet heard from him today. but. Are you hearing up there that we could very likely hear from him as well? Congressman Nelson has scheduled a press conference at about 4 o'clock this afternoon. To uh, He was on the most recent space uh, flight, as a matter of fact. Uh, came back from it very successfully, uh, very much a booster of the space program, as are most members of Congress, Tom. It is a program that has really enjoyed tremendous success here, even uh, back during the 60s when we were first trying to get to the moon. There was a lot of talk about uh, we, we ought not to be doing this, we ought to be putting our money somewhere else. But in fact, Congress continued to support it and continues to support the shuttle program. There are, of course, some questions raised for members of the House Armed Services Committee and the Senate Armed Services Committee. They are going to question what all this means first for the military space program. The military had depended to a certain extent on the space shuttle to launch some military satellites. Of course, there were other expendable rockets that were used for that as well. So um, in the military, where you have had people who've questioned the value of the shuttle program all along, this is going to add fuel to that controversy. 
it seems to me that it also raises some questions about SDI, the Star Wars program. When Senator Lautenberg was up here today, he was talking about the fact that that uh, you're getting into areas of tremendous high tech here, where you're depending on technological feats which have never been accomplished before. And when you look at something which is, compared to SDI, as relatively simple as the shuttle program, then it has to raise questions in your mind and it has to give you pause uh, as to whether or not we should be going ahead with the SDI program, whether or not it can in fact do all the wondrous things that the administration claims it will do. Tom? Uh, John, I, my guess is that you're not hearing much uh, learned discussion about the future of the space program today up there. I, my guess is that members of both the Senate and the House are reacting as the rest of us are, trying to deal with our own emotions as we watch all of this holding out the slimmest of hope that uh, perhaps one of the astronauts or all of them could have survived, although that seems almost totally unlikely at this time. Are you hearing any real profound discussion about what the program may do? People here, of course, react in a very human fashion to, uh, to what's going on. They're just as human as the rest of us in a situation like this, and they were just as stunned as the rest of us by this news. What every senator and every House member has said is that there has to be a pause. NASA must not fly another shuttle until we know what happened. The consensus seems to be that NASA should examine it, that they have the expertise, there should not necessarily be a blue ribbon panel, but that NASA should go ahead now, examine what happens. It is still, to a certain extent, a test program, and in any test program, you are going to expect failures like this. Congress, the reaction from here has been, in that sense, very mature and not hysterical. No one has said, oh, let's call it off because it's just not working. But there are real financial constraints in the country already, and this, uh, this space shuttle that blew up today cost more than a billion dollars, probably cost a billion and a half to replace it. That's going to have an effect, no matter how we feel about it right now, on the entire budget process, isn't it? Graham Rudman certainly is going to have an effect on NASA, because as one of your guests earlier uh, was talking about the fact that this is one-fourth of the civilian space program that blew up today, one space shuttle out of four. That's going to have to be replaced um, if we are, in fact, to continue at the same level. Graham Rudman, the, uh, the law mandating cuts in the budget, is certainly going to have an effect on the space program. Will we go ahead and uh, replace that space shuttle, or will we just uh, let it pass and go ahead with three at this point? Thank you very much, John Dancy on Capitol Hill today. We want to remind you once again of what we have ahead of us in about 10 minutes. We expect to hear from NASA officials their first full-blown report since the explosion on board, it appeared to be in the external tank of the Space Shuttle Challenger today, about two minutes after uh, liftoff, actually a little less than that, somewhere between one minute and two minutes altogether, at about five miles in space, about 18 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It appeared that all seven astronauts on board were killed. That includes the 37-year-old school teacher, Krista McAuliffe, who was flying as part of the civilian and space program that the Reagan administration launched uh, during the presidential campaign of 1984. The tragedy was witnessed by her husband and two small children, as well as by her parents and members of her third grade class from Concord, New Hampshire. Tonight, President Reagan will make a special address to the American people directly from the Oval Office. His State of the Union speech, which had been scheduled for 9 p.m. Eastern Time, now has been postponed until next Tuesday. What time he'll make his speech tonight, we're uncertain at this point. As soon as the White House tells us, we'll, of course, pass that along to you. Mrs. Reagan was watching all of this today, as it turns out, live on television from the private quarters at the White House. Her immediate reaction was, oh my God, and then she, according to a spokesperson, prayed that there would be some survivors of some kind, but to repeat once again, it appears that apparently all seven on board have perished in that gigantic explosion. I happen to be at the White House for a briefing with Chief of Staff Donald Regan and other correspondents and Pat Buchanan and Admiral Poindexter, who is the chairman of the National Security Council, when a note was passed to Buchanan and Poindexter, they left the room. We didn't know whether they were leaving prematurely or for what reason, when suddenly someone came back in, handed Don Regan a note, and it said simply, the shuttle has blown up, details to follow. And he looked at us, and we were as stunned as he was, and then, of course, that briefing broke up. It was shortly after that that President Reagan, or about that time that President Reagan was notified. He felt very strongly uh, about the families of all the people who were involved. He watched, as we all did, in great shock, the television replays of that explosion today. Um, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here as a nation with the space program? Where do we go from here financially and politically? Those questions simply cannot be answered today. 
But the risk, of course, that we all take in being involved in great enterprises is that human sacrifice of one kind or another will be required, as we heard John Glenn saying a little while ago. The real question that remains to be answered, of course, is was there some kind of incompetence on the part of those people who are charged with the space shuttle program? I'm only raising it as a question. We do not know the answer to that yet. That will take a long and meticulous investigation before we can determine that. But the American public will be demanding some difficult uh, answers to some difficult questions. And of course, we'll all have to examine what it is that we want from this era of high technology. Dan Molina is at Houston. That's at the Johnson Space Center there, where he has been keeping track of what little they know at this time. Dan? Krista McAuliffe looks every inch an astronaut these days, and her crewmates treat her like one of the gang. This was a little trek up to break the sound barrier with Dick Scobie, her mission commander. They could have very easily said, oh, you know, there's a teacher, what are we going to do with her? She's going to get in the way, or we've got to plan things around her. If I needed help during the lessons, if I needed an extra pair of hands, I mean, they've just been so wonderful. I, I really do feel part of the crew. For several months now, doctors have been jabbing and probing her, zipping her up in black bags to see if small dark places scare her. She's gone through all sorts of training and shuttle simulators, and she's learned a few cold, hard facts about what to expect. I didn't, I didn't realize it was so slippery. The shuttle's small. And if you kind of think of it as being in a, maybe a six-man tent with seven people in it, and it rains for six days, that's the environment that you're in. It's all a very big change from life in Concord, New Hampshire. This was the day she left home for four and a half months of training. It seemed especially tough to say goodbye to her daughter, Caroline. Love you. All right, I'll see you later, alligator. Okay, let's get dinner ready. Yes. Okay. Life without mother in the McAuliffe household. A new adventure for Krista's husband, Steve, and attorney. Okay. Frozen cook. Frozen cook. Open that thing up. He's doing a super job. I mean, he took over single parenting without missing a beat. The kids are doing well. He's doing well. I mean, he's doing so well that when I came home the last time, I walked in the kitchen to do something, and he kind of looked and he said, excuse me, he said, we don't do that that way anymore. I said, Pardon me. <laughs> She's part astronaut now, but still a teacher first. There's an elaborate plan for her to teach from space and to hook up a direct link with her old school. Much of the country will see this ultimate field trip, and Krista says it's just the kind of recognition teachers need. And because they feel so good about themselves and the morale is high, I'm hoping that other people are going to look at that and say, they do a very important job. She'll earn a place in history when Challenger lifts off. She'll be a celebrity for a while. Then it'll all be over. Krista McCullough will be back in New Hampshire, back in her classroom, but she'll always be known as the teacher in space. Dan Molina, NBC News at the Johnson Space Center, Houston. Now, of course, her legacy is tragically different. Uh, Vice President George Bush and a contingent directed by President Reagan now departing Washington, D.C. for the Kennedy Space Center at uh, Cape Canaveral. John Palmer is standing by in New York where he has a report for us on the weather conditions that existed this morning at the time of liftoff. John? Yes, Tom. Um, our meteorologist here in New York, Joe Witte, uh, has done some checking. Uh, it was below freezing down at the Cape for many hours during the night, and it wasn't until about 10 o'clock mid-morning when the temperature rose above uh, 32. The lowest temperature early in the morning just before dawn was 25 degrees, and that, of course, resulted in those icicles on part of the spacecraft and on the booster rockets, uh, icicles that they knocked off, and then after a while dismissed that as, as possibly being any kind of a problem. Another weather thing that is quite interesting, a phenomenon, is is the jet stream, which normally, of course, is in the upper part of the United States, but we know of the much publicized cold weather in the last couple of days, and the jet stream dropped down as low as uh, Florida, as, as low as uh, uh, the area around the Cape there, and winds at an altitude uh, right here of seven to nine miles above the launch pad were 100 miles an hour. That's an unusual condition to have the jet stream moving that far into the south. Now, there are, of course, nothing, no definitive reports on, on the fate of the crew, but we all have been saying this afternoon, and uh, it uh, has been very much confirmed from the experts uh, that it's pretty impossible that anyone could have uh, survived that. Uh, we will know in about uh, six minutes when NASA officials in uh, Cape Canaveral 
uh, come out and talk to reporters and answer questions. There are some unofficial reports coming to officials uh, and national officials at the Cape indicating that they have found no large, even no large pieces of debris and certainly no sign of life at the impact zone some uh, 15, 18, or 25 miles uh, off the coast uh, out in the Atlantic from the launch pad. And now let's go back to, uh, let's go to Bob Bazell. Bob? Uh, John, I've been listening to what you were saying about the weather. Uh, that it may have been an important factor, but NASA always has a plane that goes up above the launch site to measure the uh, winds at different altitude. And one of the things that they're always concerned about is, is what they call wind shear, which is a sharp change in the wind direction. It's not so much the velocity at those upper altitudes that matter during a launch. It's sudden changes in the wind direction that cause even more pressure. And has been, has, has been pointed out many times this morning, the explosion aboard the Challenger occurred this morning at uh, what the engineers call maximum Q, or maximum aerodynamic pressure. When the rockets are being pushed to their, their ultimate thrust, and the greatest amount of stress is put on the shuttle. Now, during the fifth shuttle mission, uh, Commander Vance Brand has said that at that moment he felt uh, like the uh, shuttle was about to fly apart, uh, and some structural changes were made at that point, and they uh, did not allow the, the rockets to be pushed as far as they might have been for a long time. Now, of course, all of this is speculation. Uh, we hope that in a few minutes when Jess Moore, who is the head of the shuttle program, comes down to talk to us uh, from uh, Cape Canaveral in Florida, that we will have our first information from NASA. This is very important because as long as we continue to speculate. But looking at the tape, it does appear that it occurred at a time when uh, Dick Scobie, the commander, pushed to maximum thrust. There was a physical event going on at that moment. And to recap something that I said earlier, uh, several hours earlier, we've been talking for a long time, and I think it's especially poignant right now, that uh, Commander Scobie did tell me uh, several times, as a matter of fact, because this was something that we talked about, that someday a shuttle was going to blow up. He said he's a, he had been a test pilot, he had been a Vietnam uh, veteran, much decorated for combat missions in Southeast Asia, and he said that there was no question in his mind that someday a space shuttle would explode. He said it was a complex piece of machinery, a lot of explosives. You have to remember that you have to have enough rocket thrust to get 17,000 miles an hour to go into orbit. Hundreds of thousands of pounds of explosive fuel. And someday this complex piece of machinery was going to fail, just like inevitably, if you have enough air airplane flights, one of those airplanes is going to crash. So that happened. And he said that he certainly hoped that the shuttle program didn't come to an end. Now, I think that that is not going to be the case for a while. There's certainly going to be a, a postponement in the shuttle program because, as other people pointed out this morning, it has always been NASA's po uh, policy when there's even the slightest glitch not to fly again until anybody discovers what caused that glitch. So here we have, obviously, a much more serious situation. It's going to take extremely complex analysis. The engineers uh, at several locations around the country are now beginning what they call failure analysis. That is to try to recreate the accident as best they possibly can, both from the videotapes and from what's called the telemetry, that is the information that's being sent by all sorts of automatic devices on the spacecraft. And when they try to recreate that, they'll try to find what the failure was. And until, the one thing we can say for certain is, until that is understood, and until somebody can say what caused that accident, there will never be another shuttle flight. Now, uh, it could be very soon. It could be that it was a, a fairly simple failure and something that can be replaced, in, or, the, or it could be because of the nature of the vast uh, explosion that it'll, know, that it'll be a long time until it'll be found. But right now we just don't know, and we're looking forward to uh, hearing from Jess Moore uh, at Cape Canaveral any time now. Bob, uh, we can go back certainly to January of 1967. That was the last time there was loss of life uh, with the American space program. And that was the fire aboard the capsule of the Apollo when uh, astronaut Virgil Grissom and two other astronauts uh, lost their lives that tragic night when that fire occurred. But it's, I think, worth noting that it was some 18 months before they launched again. So that might give us some idea of the kind of investigation, the kind of work, the kind of painstaking care that's going to be involved here in trying to find out what went wrong. Now, in about uh, a minute and a half, excuse me, Bob? Yeah, we've just gotten word here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory that the press conference has been delayed for half an hour, and we can expect it to start at 4 o'clock Eastern time. To continue on uh, along that point about the Apollo accident, uh, one of the things that in, in people talking about the history of the space program have always said that the Apollo program, the rush to get a man on the moon, had proceeded uh, in a way that wasn't uh, the best way until that accident. And in fact, it was that accident and the 18-month delay that you talked about made NASA reconsider it, the, its entire approach to, to manned spaceflight. And many people said that many of the successes that followed never would have been possible if it hadn't been for that terrible tragedy. Now, 
we have a situation here, obviously, where the same kind of extensive analysis will have to go on again. But one of the things that was part of the space shuttle program was redundancy. That was there was at least two of everything that was needed for a safe flight. And so it could not have been a simple failure that caused this thing, a simple failure of something that was necessary. It was more, it was what uh, engineers call a catastrophic failure. All, several things had to go wrong at once. And from the looks of those tapes, that was certainly the case. Thank you very much, Bob Bazell. This is Tom Brokaw back in Washington. And John Palmer in New York, if you'll both just stand by there, as we all will throughout the day. It is now coming up on uh, 3.30. Eastern Standard Time. We want to remind our local stations along the way that if they want to return to their local programming, now is the time to do that. NBC News, of course, will continue its coverage of this tragedy involving the Space Shuttle Challenger and what appears to be the deaths of seven astronauts on board, including teacher Krista McAuliffe. Uh, we'll continue our coverage here right along the way. We want to tell you as well that on Capitol Hill today, there was the same kind of shock reaction that we've all had across the country. House Speaker Thomas P. Tip O'Neill went to the Speaker's uh, microphone in the well of the, uh, well of the House of Representatives, and he offered his comments on what we've all been through. These wonderful people, Francis Scobie, Michael Smith, Judith Resnick, Ronald McNair, Alison Onzikuka, Krista McGollop, Gregory Javis, died performing their duty. They died not as individuals of a crew, but working as a team, united in devotion and a commitment to the United States, their country. This afternoon, we are united in the same spirit as the crew. All our deep feeling for them. We pray for these brave Americans, for their families. House Speaker Thomas P. Tip O'Neill talking about the deaths of the astronauts. There's been no official confirmation of that, but of course it's important to indicate that we all believe that there was no way that they could have survived that enormous explosion that was described to Roy Neal earlier in the day as the size of a small nuclear charge. It appears that the large external tank just blew up. The commander of this mission, as Bob Bazell indicated a few moments ago, was Francis R. Richard Scobie, a 46-year-old commander, a uh, member of the astronaut corps, veteran of Vietnam, talked to Bob about the dangers inherent in any space shuttle flight. And recently, he was asked whether it was a good idea to put a civilian on board like Krista McAuliffe. There ought to be some return on the investment because it's not cheap to fly people in space and it's not undangerous it's it's not you know it, it may look that way but and we do these flights repetitively and they get kind of a, a commonplaceness to them that's really not there because each one of them is an individual technological marvel in itself and you lose that by watching so many of them there are a lot of things that go on during a space flight and it's not easy to do and it's and it may look easy from the outside it's not easy from the inside and so you ought to be sending people like this that are going to make a return on that investment and it really is an investment in them so there ought to be a return involved in it and in this case there is Richard Scobie the 46 year old commander of the shuttle Challenger which blew up today shortly after he sent word back to Cape Canaveral Roger go at full throttle up just moments later the entire spacecraft was engulfed in a gigantic explosion and debris began to rain down on the Atlantic Ocean Steve Delaney is at Cape Canaveral now, where he has been with veteran watchers of the space shuttle program all day long. We're all left to wait until NASA has something to say, and Steve is standing by now with a veteran space correspondent. Steve? Apparently, we are having audio difficulties once again from the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral, Florida. Steve Delaney is there. We'll ask him to stand by because we'll expect to go back to him before uh, this half hour is out to bring you up to date in about 25 minutes. They've now moved it up a little bit. NASA does expect to have its first formal news conference on what happened today, if they know, in fact, at this point. There's been some indication from people who have been watching that the explosion was so complete that there may be no indication that we can make at this time of what caused the explosion itself. 
We, uh, we want to show you, for those of you who are joining us along the way, just what happened as the word spreads across the country about the blow up of the space shuttle program. I remember vividly that moment 19 years ago, of course, when there was the fire on the launch pad that caused the deaths of the three astronauts at that time in the Apollo program. They were such familiar names to us, and we had believed that this Right Stuff crew could only do right. But we learned that day that things could go wrong as we have once again today. Here's what happened today. We have main engine start, four, three, two, one, and liftoff, liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Roger, roll, Challenger. Good roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. Engines beginning throttling down now at 94 percent. Normal throttles uh, for most of the flight, 104 percent. We'll throttle down to 65 uh, percent shortly. Engines at 65 percent, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. Velocity 2,257 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles, downrange distance three nautical miles. Throttling up, three engines now at 104 percent. Challenger, go at throttle up. Challenger, go at throttle up. The last words. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, nine nautical miles. Downrange distance, seven nautical miles. The NASA commentator continuing. The family, once again, her parents, right in the middle of your picture, not sure what has happened. Something terrible has gone wrong. Others realize. in slow motion now. The entire external tank just comes apart. A gigantic explosion that no one conceivably could have survived, it seems to all of us. Nonetheless, search crews continue to go over a wide part of the Atlantic where debris rained down. There were Coast Guard cutters and helicopters in that area. It's a routine procedure, standby. Steve Delaney now is at uh, Cape Canaveral in Florida. That's the Kennedy Space Center, as he was just a few moments ago. Now we are told that his microphone is working. Steve? Well, let's see if it is. Um, Tom, you were talking a moment ago about being unable to believe that what we were seeing was really what was happening. Uh, this is the first time I've been here, and, and I was just en enraptured by the whole liftoff process and did not know until perhaps after some other people had figured out that something had gone terribly wrong. And one of those might have been Tom Boyle of the Tipton Conservative, who's been down here covering this sequence of launches ever since Apollo 11, I'm told, right? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my first indication, personally, that it uh, had gone haywire was uh, during the pitch over when it's, uh, uh, the smoke trail gets in the way, is that the solid uh, exhaust tends to get dimmer and dimmer, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it was brighter, which was the apparent, evidently an explosion, and uh, I thought, that's not right, and then uh, I saw, yeah. then I saw the uh, solids uh, out to each side, and uh, I thought, uh-oh, our TLS says hang on to them till they burn out, and uh, then uh, but Shortly you knew that something that, at that point was out of yeah, sequence, out and, then, of, and then bits and pieces began to fall yes. through the sky, and you were... When I saw the pieces, um, I knew uh, as far away as I was that something was wrong. Evidently, it was about 13 miles slant yeah. range. Of all the times that you have come down here, do you always have, at the point where they're getting off the ground and heading for space, do you always have the nagging feeling that something might, something like this might happen? Yes, uh, especially on... Uh, the first shuttle, first flight of Columbia, that uh, nobody really knew what it was going to be like, and uh, anyway, that uh, I uh, was uh, fixed at watching uh, the climb of the vehicle, and uh, you tend to get this little unbalanced feeling as you start looking high in the sky, and what? I thought it might be off track, but yeah, it wasn't. But that this was time, only... what did you file? 
Um, I uh, haven't filed uh, completely yet. Uh, I uh, called uh, back to the paper and told them what it looked like to me, and they were already seeing what uh, was on uh, on uh, TV well, that, because it was, oh, a good hour before you could yeah. get through a phone. Tom, you just watched here a moment ago, and they played the slow-motion replay yes. of what happened. Uh, you hadn't seen that before. What did that no. site do for you? to you? Well, uh, it confirmed to me that uh, it wasn't the solids, that uh, I could see something in there. I'd have to watch it one or two more times because uh, also between the tank and the belly of the shuttle, you can sometimes see the, con uh, the forming of a condensation trail or a contrail like an airliner leaves, and it's just an instantaneous intermittent thing. And uh, but this time it wasn't condensation, evidently. There's been some, uh, and we, we've done nothing but speculate as carefully and as, as um, clearly as we can label it that this or that might have happened. What about the low temperature this morning? In, in your mind, is that a consideration uh, for them to look at? To me, it is not because it's it's uh, cold to us. Mm -hmm. But uh, you have to remember that uh, liquid hydrogen temperature approaches absolute zero. It's 400 and some degrees below zero so, Fahrenheit. So the difference between chilly and warm for us doesn't and, make that much difference. Uh, I would say not. However, uh, I don't deal in cryogenics. Uh, you are you are dealing in fact, so you are going to go to the news conference. And do, you, do you expect yes, them to, to enlighten us much more than what we already know? Yes. Or is it too early? Yeah, uh, no, they will enlighten us more. They will have some empirical data about how high, how far, how fast, and what uh, came down and what's Everything out there looking. Wine, perhaps. Uh, yes, sir. Well, that comes up in 20 minutes or so, and everybody here and everybody across the country will be um, following it with great care and interest uh, as this day, which was supposed to be the, the accomplishment of a lifetime for one school teacher from New Hampshire and six of her colleagues, turned into tragedy. We'll, uh, Tom, uh, that's about it from here right now. Thank you, Steve. And a member of those six colleagues, a regular member of the astronaut corps, was a woman by the name of Judy Resnick. She had a Ph.D. in electrical engineering from the University of Maryland. She was the second woman to go into space right after Sally Ride. She was a, pay a payload specialist, that is, that she worked uh, in the back, and we're going to be hearing from her in a few moments. But there is this great irony, of course, that it was 19 years ago yesterday that the last deaths recorded in NASA occurred on a launch pad at the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral, Florida. That was Apollo 1. They were running some tests at the time, and here are the astronauts who were involved. They were led by Virgil Gus Grissom. It was Lieutenant Colonel Ed White, of course, and Roger Chaffee. And they were taken out and put in the capsule aboard the big Apollo 1 rocket, the Saturn rocket. And it was there that a flash fire occurred, and they were unable to get out, and they were all killed. The burn capsule. We were stunned by that one as well, I remember vividly, because once again, the can-do attitude of NASA left us all with the impression that nothing really could go wrong, that these experts who know things right down to the last digit point, one kind or another, had it all figured out. Well, we learned then that there can be tragedies involved in the space program, but it's been now almost 19, almost 20 years, actually, since there's been another death, and today, apparently, we've had seven of them, including a school teacher from Concord, New Hampshire, and Judy Resnick, a woman member of the astronaut corps who talked recently with Dan Molina about the presence of Krista McAuliffe on board this flight. So, uh, McAuliffe going up is, of course, a, a major step in, in the space program. The, how, what are your general feelings, your uh, individually, about the citizen uh, participant program? Do you? I, I'm sure you think it's a good idea, but can you tell me why? Well, the space shuttle is a national resource, and we career astronauts uh, do the things that that we're supposed to do to get carry a mission out, to deploy payloads, to retrieve them, to operate experiments. And when we come back, uh, we talk to the public a little bit about what we did, but then we have to go on and train for other missions because that's our our goal in life. In the case of Krista or of a, a participant, um, she will get an opportunity to participate, obviously, and to see what goes on in the space shuttle, uh, to be a member of the team, and then she can come back and devote some time to talking to people uh, about what it is that we do more broadly. I think it's a complement to what we do uh, as opposed to a replacement for the astronauts talking. I think she can enhance and highlight 
what it is that, that we have to say to the public about what we do and bring home a little bit more how important it is, the types of things that we're doing and how they will benefit people back on Earth. What's it been like having her train with you folks? Has it been smooth and has perhaps has her participation giving, given you any uh, fresh perspectives on yourself? Have her observations or the fact that she's a total novice at all this, uh, has, has it been of interest to you for any particular reason, any incidents perhaps that have come up? Krista has been training with us since September, which is a little bit longer than we normally uh, do for other payload specialists who may have some more scientific or space-oriented background. And she has not only developed her own uh, set of procedures that she's going to be doing in space, she has participated in our training to understand what it is we're doing, when we're doing things, how we're doing things, what the environment's going to be like. And she has fit in very well as a member of the team. I think she's going to be very helpful to us. We're hopefully going to be helpful to her that we can, we can work together to get all of our objectives done in a, in a timely fashion. And I think that uh, we couldn't have picked a better person to do the job. Oh, that's, that's very good. Have, have, uh, have there been any particular incidents that have stuck in your mind, anything that's happened that uh, pointed out the fact that uh, here's a teacher and we're astronauts? Has, has, there, has there been a big distinction between her as, a, as somebody from the outside and you folks as people on the inside? Krista came into this program knowing very little about how we uh, do things on the space shuttle other than what she had learned from being uh, a member of the public who isn't involved in space. And she has come a very long way. She's very well versed on what it is we're doing, how the shuttle uh, operates, what types of things it does. And I think she's, uh, she's become a student um, herself so that she can then later become a teacher to her students. Yeah. Are you going to participate in any of that? All of us are going to be helping Krista um, with the things that she's doing um, because it's a, it's a pretty well uh, choreographed team effort. Mm -hmm. What do you look forward to next, Dr. Resnick? This will be your second shuttle flight. What are, you, what are your personal ambitions at this point? Well, this is my second flight, and I'm looking forward to having a third flight right now. Mm -hmm. That's a, a short-term goal. And as a long-term goal, I'd like to stay with the space program as long as they want me. Um, as an astronaut if I can, and if not, I'd like to stay in some other capacity because I think it's very important. Judy Resnick, uh, PhD in electrical engineering. She was a friend of mine. I do not hesitate to tell you. I met her on the launch of the first shuttle when she was our mission expert commentator. We uh, maintained a kidding relationship over the years. Uh, we once had a bet that I will say to you candidly involved a six pack of beer on the launch of a shuttle. She won the bet, and I sent it to her, enveloped in a dozen long stem red roses. And she called me and said, Broca, I like the six-pack better than I did the roses. A lot of mischief beneath that serious demeanor. Great loss to her family, of course, and a great loss to the astronaut corps, Judith Resnick. Bill Nelson, a congressman from Florida, was involved in the last uh, shuttle mission. He's on Capitol Hill now, where he's meeting with reporters. Well, maybe he isn't. Uh, Congressman Nelson, you'll remember, had a successful mission. He uh, represents that district in Florida where the uh, space shuttle program is yeah. located. Uh, and he went up after several delays and had what I think was a five-day mission that went quite well once they were in space. They launched successfully some communication satellites. And they returned about a day early because they were concerned about the weather conditions uh, for landing based on the meteorological forecast. One more indication of how very careful NASA is in terms of the safety factor, they just don't do anything, do, do anything on a whim. They try to work out as carefully as they possibly can what the conditions are likely to be and what the technology is going to be and what it's capable of doing before they send anyone up in space. Um, Congressman Nelson, of course, was one of those members of Congress who has been very instrumental in promoting the space program. There were those people who thought that he had been chosen for that reason, as well as the fact that he lived in the Florida district where the space shuttle is launched from. Uh, NASA is not unaware of the fact that they have to have friends in Congress as well as in the rest of the country because it's an expensive program and they want to promote it as best as they can. The teacher part of this program, Krista McAuliffe was involved in, they'd hoped to be able to teach uh, other members of upcoming generations about what space may mean to them and that you would be able to conduct the classrooms in space, as you heard Judy Resnick talking about that just a few moments ago. And of course, all that will be put on hold. 
How this will affect this generation is very hard to know. Maybe Bill Nelson has some thoughts on that. Let's go to Congressman Nelson. Pulling on one of the solid rocket motors. As it turned out, after the scrub, when they re-ran the system, they found out that it was a faulty sensor, not the hydraulic pressure unit, the HPUs. Had, uh, had we gone, and had it been a malfunctioning APU, it could have been a very bad day. Well, that's why you have the redundancies and the checks. Now, as far as ascent, uh, both uh, of the solid rocket motors, those are the two big ones that look like big, big candlesticks that are packed with the solid fuel. They have to light off at precisely the same time or else you could get a cartwheeling effect uh, right at the pad. And then on ascent, uh, if you don't have their performance as is uh, scheduled, or if you don't have the performance of all three main engines, you have all kinds of uh, contingencies. One of the contingencies is to come back around and land at the Kennedy Space Center. Another contingency, if you lose one engine, is to go on and land in Dakar, Senegal, or Moron, Spain. Another contingency, if you've got enough energy, is to go once around and come back to Edwards. Uh, but where there is an explosion, such as occurred today, there are no contingencies, and that's part of uh, the risk that is taken. No. I, I couldn't hear you. No. As uh, our professional manager. Congressman Bill Nelson of Florida, who just recently completed a successful mission talking about the escape and emergency procedures that are built into any shuttle launch program. And of course, he concluded by saying, when you have an explosion of the magnitude that we had today, there's nothing that you can do. Roy Neal remembers the, uh, the investigation that followed the fire on the pad on Saturn One back in 1967, I guess it was, Roy, 19 years ago yesterday. What do you remember about the investigation and what NASA was able to learn? Well, I remember this time. It was a very long time ago, but the Apollo 1 fire uh, brought to the attention of the nation the fact that they had a, a space program that was, if you will, based on feet of clay. As a result, they conducted the most sweeping investigation in the history of United States technology. There was much breast beating, much brow beating, but in the final analysis, NASA decided that it had to redesign its entire spacecraft go to an entirely new oxygen system, if you will, before they could fly again. I'm not suggesting that this may take a total redesign of the space shuttle. There have been too many uh, successful flights to date. But what I am suggesting is that right now, a NASA team, probably what they call a blue ribbon panel, but in this case with uh, the top engineers, the top scientists that NASA can command, is being put together. We may even hear some announcement of that when NASA comes to the fore with a news conference now expectable in just about seven or eight minutes. I wouldn't be at all surprised if they announce at that time that a committee has been named by NASA from within itself uh, to conduct an equally sweeping investigation. And uh, it could be that before they're finished, uh, the space shuttle may have to go through some redesign factors, but the likelihood right now uh, based on research being conducted at this minute at the Marshall Space Flight Center and here in California out at the Rocketdyne Division and the Space Divisions of Rockwell. Uh, based on that, the likelihood is that the problem this time is a far smaller uh, signature, is far less in import than the one that caused the Apollo 1 fire, but it will be totally investigated. We can expect such a committee to be named and shortly, and uh, I'm sure that we, the public, will probably know more about what really did happen, thanks to the telemetry beam down from space, probably know more than any of us can really handle in the not too far distant future. Analysis is going on now, Tom. Thank you very much, Roy Neal, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in uh, Pasadena today. That's the only experience that we've had, of course, with a tragedy of this magnitude. There have been problems along the way. Um, here's a kind of a chronology now of the major problems during previous missions in the shuttle program. You'll recall back in uh, April of 1981, the first launch, the first critical test flight of the space shuttle launch attempt was halted in the final seconds. We all remember that. It was delayed for two days by those computer software problems. And then in November of 1981, 
on the second shuttle, a fuel cell failed, limiting power supply and forcing the mission to be cut short by a couple of days. In March of 1982, bad weather forced a one-day delay. February of 1984, two satellites deployed smoothly from the spacecraft, but they failed to reach their proper orbit. This is a big part of this uh, space shuttle program. It's a kind of space airliner and space truck all at the same time. What NASA is doing is carrying into space private enterprise, in effect, launching satellites for companies like RCA, for example, uh, also conducting some pharmaceutical experiments for pharmaceutical companies in the weightless environment that exists up there. What they hope to do is to have a kind of synergy, if you will, between the federal government and the space program and private enterprise. They expected that the shuttle program would pay its own way, that you would hire the shuttle so that you could carry out these experiments. And they had hoped by now to be having a launch a week. Well, of course, that was cut way back. They expected maybe they could have at least 15 launches in this year, and that was quite ambitious. And that is unrealistic at this time. There's some question about whether we'll have any more launches for the balance of this year because of the nature of the investigation that will be required. We want to show you some of the uh, training films of the crew that was involved in this shuttle Challenger launch today what astronauts go through. A lot of people think it's a pretty glamorous business. You sit around in the pilot's lounge until it's time to strap up and then take off. Well, it's not that at all. It's a rigorous, demanding profession that involves a lot of, uh, of the sciences, physics and otherwise, and also it's a demanding physical regimen. That is, that they put in long days going through the various procedures. There's Krista McAuliffe, who was the school teacher. She was on a uh, consolidated program, of course, preparing for this flight. Most NASA officials said, look, if you're in pretty good physical condition and you're generally alert, that you can get through this all right. This, this, this is, is this brown or black? This brown. It's brown. This is your stuff. Ellison Anazuka, who was there with her, as you can see in the background, the first Japanese American to go up. <laughs> He was scheduled to launch in 84, but he couldn't do that then. That's Judy Resnick that we just, we just heard from her, looking very serious. But as I say, there was that mischievous side to her as well. Gregory Jarvis, payload specialist. That is people who work with that big Canadian arm in the background. Now they're gearing up. They get into all of this paraphernalia only for the takeoff. Then when they're in space, they're able to live pretty comfortably, actually, within the confines of the space shuttle itself. As Bob Bazell indicated earlier, the toilet is kind of tricky to operate. But all the indications were that everything was going to go OK. Which uh, cup unit is mine plug it to? Ronald McNair is the black astronaut. He's a magna cum laude graduate of North Carolina A&T and a presidential scholar. He's one of America's first four black astronauts. I've been in the cockpit of uh, one of the space shuttles. What you do is crawl down into it from uh, on top. It's relatively confined, but once they get up there again, as I indicate to you, they can uh, move around a little bit, although for a five or six day period, uh, it's close quarters. Okay. That is Krista McAuliffe, who's in the foreground here. And I think Gregory Jarvis, who is seated beside her. It's got that little drawstring on it, so you can tie it off. Would you like one? I need one. Yes, oh. Teachers are always prepared. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> On liftoff, other astronauts have told me before that it's an exciting sensation because there's an awful lot of thrust that has developed, more than two million pounds on either side of you with those solid rocket boosters, but it's nothing that the human body can't withstand even those bodies that are untrained, in effect, to the extreme force of Gs. There you can see how close the quarters are. And that's where they were strapped in today, still in place. When the explosion occurred, that it appears to all who have looked at it, killed them all.
Mr. McNair. Two children and a wife, Cheryl. Is all the fuse operation in El Segundo? No. Uh, Ron, now you can request an MS transfer bag, which is like a pouch, a um, mailman's type bag. Hell, I don't know how strong those lockers are. I wouldn't trust my way, on. Get me up there, then I'll get this. <laughs> We just received word that President Reagan will make his address live to the nation tonight at 5 p.m. That's in one hour from now, Eastern Standard Time. I had a terrible set of events. I lived in Boston for two years and then went to the And you just start putting all your stuff.